Okay then. So 1997, September 1997, was a big year for Porsche, wasn't it? It was the introduction of this, the 996, a car that was quicker, faster, safer, lighter, and more economical than the air-cooled 993 replaced it. In the two decades since, the 996 has been absolutely chastised, hasn't it? But now at last, it's finally finding its feet. You can get the keys to the 911 Legend for less than 20,000 pound in both Gen 1 996 form and Gen 2. So which one's better? Well, it all comes down to personal preference, really. So what we're gonna do in this video is look at the material and indeed immaterial differences between the Gen 1 and Gen 2 Porsche 996. First things first, we're going to discuss the Gen 1 car. This was such a step change for Porsche and it's really important to get that across. This was the first ground up 100% brand new 911 since the 911's inception in 1963. Design wise, there's clear homogeny, isn't there, with the 986 Boxster, which drew criticism at launch, of course. But again, this was all about saving money at the company to stop it going out of business ultimate bang for the buck, as my previous interview with Pinky Lime mentioned. The lights, the fried egg headlights, they are one piece. Now the whole point of making these one piece lights that had high beam, low beam, fog light, indicators, parking light, all in one was so that they could be assembled on the production line in 20 seconds. Absolute form over function. That's what Porsche is all about, don't forget. The front bumper itself, I mean, again, that is real kind of boxster, isn't it? That whole front of the car, and in fact, the design of the 996 in general in Gen 1 form, it's sculptural, isn't it? That's exactly the words that Pinky Lai used again in my interview with him. There's not a lot of aggression to it, but it still looks fast, doesn't it? Biased now, of course, but I think the car's really aged well, but it really is that sculptural 911 that harks back exactly to those original 911s from 1963. 17 inch wheels, you don't see 17 inches on 996s quite a lot, do you? A lot of people went for the optional 18 inches. So this is really, really refreshing to see the original specification of seven by 17 inch at the front and nine by 17 inch at the rear. Um, we'll walk to the back of the car. I'm gonna talk about interior in a minute. Um, engine wise, M96 engine, wasn't it? M9601 on these early cars, as you can tell by the amber lenses. Yes, there's a lot of weight gained in the engine area because of the water cooling and the associated plumbing that goes with it. But also don't forget, because the car is cooled by water and not air, it doesn't need as much oil. Removing things like the cooling fan also means that we could go to four valve technology for the first time on a 911. Um, six speed manual gearbox. We'll talk more about the mechanicals and, and the real world differences of that on the road shortly, but it's a six speed manual for the Gen 1. Tiptronic was available as a five speed for the first time, the 903 was four speed. Um, also for the Carrera fours, these are both twos by the way, but for the Carrera fours, for the first time the all wheel drive 911 got the semi-automatic gearbox of Tiptronic. Limited slip diff was an optional extra on these cars. Fun fact for you, on these early 996s, they actually used the limited slip differential from the 993. We'll look at the interior now, pop your head through there. This really is a step change, isn't it, over the air-cooled era. Completely redesigned in here, it's Wolfgang Mobius that designed the 996's completely unique interior. As we well know, the 997 that followed it went back to more of that traditional 911 aesthetic of the more rigid style door cars, none of this kind of millennium era swaves and circles that we've got going on. Um, the four spoke steering wheel it was largely carried over from the 903 actually, it's one of the very few things that was. The three spoke steering wheel was optional, the sport wheel, it became standard specification on the Gen 2 which we'll talk about a bit later on. We have to be honest don't we, the 996 interior is blighted by poor materials, poor plastics. It doesn't scream premium sports car does it? Really bizarre decisions that were made for the Gen 1 996, chief of which, and it's a real bugbear for somebody like me who daily drives their 996, no cup holders. You'll also notice again in terms of the deficit in practicality, there's no glove box either. The main differences of the 996 era are split of course between the Gen 1 and the Gen 2, but there was a crucial change within that Gen 1 generation and it relates to the gas pedal. 
The early cars, identified chiefly by the amber indicator lenses, such as here, they are cable throttle cars, okay? For model year 2000, the 911 lineup switched to e-gas, which is essentially drive-by-wire. If you can't check the indicators or you'd like um, proper justification as to whether your car is a cable car or not, it's an easy way to check. Behind the driver's seat, pull the chunky rear carpet up and you will quite simply see the cable throttle. That is your definitive check as to whether you have a cable throttle 996 or not. Two knock-on effects or differences really between the cable cars and e-gas. The cable cars, they have as an optional extra, a very basic traction control system, which is essentially taken from the ABS. It has an earlier Motronic system as well, computer system connected to that. It's also got mechanical deck lid and boot poppers. For the e-gas cars, these are electrically activated uh, with little switches rather than these huge handles that always scuff because they've had a quarter of a century now, people getting in and out and uh, scrubbing their feet on those. The other thing uh, relates to traction control again. Traction control, which was in the early Gen 1 cars, very basic, extremely primitive, as I said. It switched over to PSM, Porsche Stability Management, which coincided with an updated Motronic computer engine system. It's far more complex than that early traction control system. A lot more sensors with many different parameters involved uh, with regards to braking the wheels individually to keep that car nice and planted on the road with plenty of traction. Cable cars, pros, cons, well, pros, a cable rather than fly by wire if that means much to you. Um, cons, like I say, you get these pretty ugly handles rather than the little poppers and you also get the early primitive traction control system. That is a very basic and quick rundown of the Gen 1 cars. Drag coefficient by the way, 0.3, better even than the current 992 may I add. But as you can see, and as I said earlier, it has that real sculptural form that harks right the way back to the purity of those early cars from 1964. We better take this out for a drive, give it a driving appraisal, and then we can move on to this car, which is the Gen 2, and we can see how Porsche upped the 996 game from there. We'll start with the engine then, shall we? The 3.4 litre in the Gen 1, it's a real favourite of mine, to be fair. 300 horsepower, um, allied to a curb weight of 1,320 kilos. Perfect power to weight ratio for the road. You certainly don't need any more than that. So, as demonstrated, pleasingly, the Gen 1 car, I mean, it doesn't feel slow. It has a really good positive pickup. And perhaps my favourite characteristic about the 3.4 litre engine is, I mean, its red line is just over seven grand, but its maximum horsepower of 300 um, is achieved at 6,800 RPM. And what that means is to get the very best out of this engine, to get the most out of it, you have to keep the revs high. Maximum torque of 320 newton meters uh, is generated at 4,800 RPM. But as I say, in terms of that peak power output, it sits right at the top and actually its power curve is beautifully linear. So the engine's a real win for me personally. I really do find favor with it. However, it's not all good news with the Gen 1 996. Exhaust wise, I mean, this is a pretty muted car. It's possibly the quietest 911 there's ever been. Water cooling, as I say, it just really muted the soundtrack of that flat six and it took them a whole generation really, them being Porsche of course, to get that right. I tell you what really is good fun in this as well, and it's the little wheels that's on the car. As I said, most people optioned up the 18 inch wheels that are slightly wider as well by half an inch, I think. These little 17s, I mean, this is what the 996 came with as standard. There's a little bit less grip to play with. And you know what, again, just talking about that power to weight balance that the 996 has, it's a real kind of positive one for the road. Just taking a little bit of that grip away as well, just adds to the excitement of the car, particularly as a, as a manual peddler. It just means that that 996 is able to just move around a little bit more. Particularly, this doesn't have the MO30 suspension, the sport suspension. This has the MO29, which is the standard specification suspension, rise 10 mil higher. It doesn't mean the 911 is not fun to drive at all. In fact, like I say, I think it's actually quite refreshing to have a 996 on the skinny wheels and the standard suspension to have a bit of fun with. Let's go this way, shall we?
absolutely wonderful. Not a week goes by on YouTube anymore where someone isn't waxing lyrical about the 996. Sorry about that. But there's definitely method to the madness. These cars are so much fun. Lovely. Cool, great fun. So that was the Gen 1 car. Then, of course, for model year 2002, which was August slash September of the 2001 calendar year, Porsche introduced the Gen 2 cars. There are a lot of differences between the Gen 1 and the Gen 2, mechanically speaking, aesthetically speaking, and in terms of ergonomics and haptics as well. It really is quite a lot of differences. The biggest one, aesthetically, at least from the front, is the ditching of that Boxster aesthetic that the Gen 1 car is known for and the adoption of the same front end ostensibly as the 996 Turbo. This new headlight design was taken directly from the 911 Turbo. The front bumper and indeed the rear bumper were changed as well, so totally different style. It's got a little bit more aggression over the Gen 1 cars. You'll notice in the corners things are just a little bit more tapered adds a little bit of aggression again between the Gen 2 and the Gen 1 cars. Um, oh, fun fact actually, the Gen 2 car is 5mm wider than the Gen 1. It's 1,770mm instead of 1,765mm. Um, I'll let you decide whether that's a boring fact or not. What isn't so boring is the track width on the Gen 2 car at the front is actually wider by 10mm over the Gen 1 car. This is also 25% stiffer than the Gen 1 as well. The brakes are the same, 318mm at the front in terms of disc size, 299mm at the back. Tire wise, the same as the Gen 1, 7 and 9 by 17 inch was the um, standard specification. A lot of people though, as you can see here, went for the upgraded 8 and 10 by 18 inch wheel setup. I'll come to the interior in a minute. The engine, the flat six, the beating heart of the 911, allegedly, according to sources, including Jürgen Barth, the M96 slash 03 that was in the Gen 2 cars is up to 80% new compared to the Gen 1 car. There was quite a lot of mechanical reworking on this, um, all for what amounted to an increase of 20 horsepower and 20 newton meters of torque. This car adopted Vario Cam Plus, which is quite a big evolution over the Vario Cam variable in lap timing that the Gen 1 car had. The exhaust as well has completely changed. It's now more freer flowing, and as we'll discover when we go for a drive in a minute, it's a lot louder as well, it sounds nicer. Um, and the six-speed gearbox as well was also refined. It was strengthened over the Gen 1 car and also got an extra bearing on the input shaft. I think that's everything on the exterior. I shall let you into the interior there and pop my head in the passenger side. Now, a face value, it looks pretty similar, doesn't it, to the Gen 1. There are some key changes though, chiefly, for me, most welcomely, cup holders. Thank God for that. Uh, it's a welcome modicum of practicality. Oh! <laughs> Glove box as well. As I mentioned earlier on about the speakers, they are now standard specification. The steering wheel is now much nicer. Ergonomically speaking, it's that three spoke sport wheel that was optional on the Gen 1 cars. I mentioned as well earlier on, didn't I, the switch gear, if I sit in on this, the switch gear, I mean, it's still the same plastic as the Gen 1. The difference is now it's got more of a matte look than the polished look of the Gen 1. The dials as well have changed with a little bit more of digital integration. Welcome in my eyes, you've now got a much better menu to flick through um, with a bit more information with things like MPG, for example, that you wouldn't otherwise have. That is very top level um, introduction to the Gen 2 996 cars. As ever, these cars are more than the sum of their parts. So let's go out on the road, test this car after the fun drive we've just had in the Gen 1 and see what it's all about. It's funny, isn't it, with the Gen 2? Ostensibly, it's the same interior, exactly the same. The difference is, there's definitely, as I've said in previous videos, just a better quality to the finish of the materials. But again, also in the way the interior is screwed together, it definitely feels a lot more opulent than the Gen 1. There's kind of no getting away from that.
<laughs> Already, this Gen 2 sounds a lot better, doesn't it? As I said earlier on in the video, complete reworking of the exhaust for the Gen 2, and it sounds all the better for it. Much more free flowing. It's a 3.6 litre engine in this car as well, still naturally aspirated, but a 20 horsepower boost to 320 horsepower and a 20 newton metre torque boost to 370 newton metres of torque. This does have a Dansk back box, which I think must be the Sport rather than the Mile that I've got, because it does sound pretty good. Peak power and torque, incidentally, is realised at the same RPMs as the Gen 1, but there is no question the 3.6 has a lot more lower down torque. So got a great pickup to it, really, really good. Whilst the 3.4 litre engine is nice and peaky, this just has that real punch of lower down torque. It really is just a case of, you know, which kind of personality through its uh, powertrain do you prefer? Dynamically, and this is the beauty of 911s, it goes to show how from one car to the next, they're totally different. In comparison to the stock chassis and the small wheels on the Gen 1, this has got the MO30 sport suspension, lowers the car by 10 mil as well, um, and the bigger and wider 18 inch wheels. Now this looks a lot more aggressive and planted also, it does feel a lot more planted as well on the road, it has to be said. And what that means, particularly on the road, is the Gen 2 car, it doesn't feel as wafty at the nose as the Gen 1 cars. Um, and also, the nose just feels a lot kind of sharper on turning. Again, the front track, 10 mil wider, isn't it, over the Gen 1, just helps with that composure through the corner. It just doesn't move around as much as that Gen 1 in front. It does mean it is a fair bit firmer on the road. I would argue that the MO30 is a little bit too firm for the road. I think there's a reason Porsche, by the turn of the 997 Gen 1, had the sport chassis with PASM, so it's switchable. There we have it then. That is, admittedly, a pretty comprehensive drill down of the differences between the Gen 1 996 and the Gen 2. Which is the better generation? Well, they both have their pros and cons, don't they? In either scenario, you should be led exclusively by condition when it comes to looking for the perfect 996 for you. Otherwise, whether Gen 1 or Gen 2, it all just comes down to personal preference.